Welcome to the program and welcome to season two of the Brian J. Matos Show. It is the podcast for curious minds as we build a community of curious minds to explore the most important topics of the world with the most educated experts that we can find on those topics. And as we kick off season two, one of our commitments to all of you who stuck with us all through season one and have been loyal listeners to the show is to bring back some of your favorite guests. And as we kick off season two, that's exactly what we're doing today as we welcome Payman Poyekta back to the program. Longtime listeners of this program will remember almost a year ago, Payman joined us to talk about startups and advice for tech startup founders and leaders, general career advice for those who are going into more of a venture capital space or venture capital-backed companies. Uh, He gave great advice for those who are entering that field as well as those who might be mid-career and thinking about their next change. Payman was one of our most listened to guests, not only from a podcast download perspective, but on our YouTube clips. Uh, To this day, he's still one of our most listened to YouTube clips on our program and quick plug for that you can find me on youtube and clips from each of our shows just search brian j matos in the search bar on the youtube site you can find our channel please subscribe so you'll be the first to see new videos when we put them out so we heard from you that you wanted to hear more from payment and so he was generous enough to come back on the program and explore a new topic so before we get into the topic we're going to get into today let me quickly give you a reminder for those who don't know or those who are new to the program Payman is based in Berlin, Germany. He is a consultant and an advisor to tech industry startups, helping them create strong, focused teams and leaders. In recent years, Payman has worked with venture capital firms, directly with startups as a strategic advisor, and he has served as C-level positions in several companies. Uh, In those roles, Payman coaches his clients how to set strategy, develop world-class products, and evaluate technology needs as they scale up their operations. Among his many career achievements, Payman joined an AI company as one of their first employees, and he helped to grow that company from the ground up as their director of engineering. By the time he exited, the firm had grown to 90 employees with offices across the U.S., the U.K., and Germany. So in our first conversation with Payman last year, we discussed common mistakes that startups make as they grow. We discussed how to be an effective leader in the tech industry, and we dispensed some great advice. If you missed that episode, I encourage you to go back. It's episode five. It was one of the first programs that we recorded a year ago. You can find that show on any of your favorite podcast uh, distribution platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, pretty much anywhere that you get your podcasts, you can find uh, find our show, subscribe, and go back to episode five. And if all else fails or you're not technologically savvy and you struggle to get subscribed to podcasts through any of those services, just go to my website. It's brianjmatos.com. It's mobile friendly as well. Go to my podcast episodes. You'll find episode five or just go in the search bar, search for Payman, P-E-Y-M-A-N, and you will find that program. You can listen to it right from my website. And you can also get instructions from my site how to download that episode to your computer and also subscribe, importantly, to the podcast series so you don't miss any episodes. So having covered all of that, some of the feedback that we received was that you wanted to hear more from Payment about his AI experience. And over the last year since we last talked to Payment, Lord knows AI has been the buzzword of the business world, the nonprofit world, the government and regulatory world. I feel like everywhere I go and everyone I talk to, this is all anybody wants to talk about, and rightfully so. I did an opinion piece uh, last year in one of the early episodes about my thoughts on artificial intelligence, how I felt it was going to be a net positive and it was going to be an assist, uh, an assistant of sorts for all of us. It wasn't going to replace people. It was going to supplement us. I still feel that way today, but I certainly hear more nervous chatter uh, than perhaps I did the wonderment of tools like ChatGPT when they first came out. 
So I thought it was important that we bring Payman back with his relevant background and experience and his continued ear to the ground of startups, tech-based companies across the world, especially in Europe, across the European Union, the UK, and the US, to kind of maybe parse the hype from the substance of AI in its current form and its current impact and implications in industries, as well as gaze into the near future where we think it will have the most impact in the next, say, one, two, three years, and then maybe step back and tackle some of the bigger questions and the bigger issues around it. I think in this conversation, you'll be fascinated to hear Payman's take on some of the industries that are probably more likely than others to get an initial benefit from the use of generative AI technology, and some of the risks, those that you may have heard that are bigger that that payment is less concerned about, some of the tools that should be adopted relatively quickly by businesses that may in fact replace some current roles but create new opportunities for others. We also explore topics like data use and data ownership in a world where data is the foundation of AI models, especially the generative models. We talk a little bit about some exciting potential use cases, as well as tools and platforms for startups that might actually help them significantly reduce the amount of time spent on, let's call them less valuable aspects of startup work. We do spend some time exploring the risk of generative, uh, excuse me, general, not generative, general intelligence and what a leap that could mean if our AI tools reach that place of not just general, uh, generative uh, AI technology, but general intelligence. And then we get into all kinds of issues that are specific to globalization and regulation and potential and technology in the hands of Uh, controversial governments, and some of the ethical considerations. So it's a wide-ranging conversation. I couldn't think of a better expert to talk to about the business applications of AI. In a few weeks, in a few episodes, we're going to have another guest on the program to talk about not just the ethics of AI, but we're going to talk more expansively about practical risks to things like election integrity to things like democracy. Uh, We're going to take the 50,000-foot view. But right now, we thought as we kick off Season 2, it was important for us to put out this conversation in a more practical and pragmatic way for all those business owners, entrepreneurs, and others out there who are trying to get their heads around this space and this topic. Uh, We think this is going to be a very good 45 minutes or so for you. Payman was again generous with his time, and so I want to get to that interview now. Uh, A quick reminder, subscribe to this program anywhere you get your podcast. Please share with your friends, share with your family. And if you don't have uh, folks who are particularly keen on listening to entire podcasts until they've had a chance to get to preview it, don't forget about that YouTube channel. Again, Payman was one of our most popular clips last year. Hopefully he will be again. But if folks just want a little taste, a little sample to see if this is interesting for them, direct them over to my YouTube channel. You can fl- find that link on my website, brianjmatos.com. You can find it on my social media channels. Uh, and just go to YouTube, search for Brian J. Matos, and find a clip from this or any other episode. Send it on to your friends and family, and I think that they'll like what they hear. And then from there, they can download the full show, come to my website, subscribe to the program, and hopefully join our community of curious minds. Without any further delay, uh, it's my honor and privilege to once again welcome Payman Poyekta to the program and to present you our conversation in its entirety. Payman, welcome back to the program. Good to see you. I'm here again. One of the things that we have talked about quite a bit on this program in the last 10 months or so since the last time you and I had a chance to get together um, has been the constant drumbeat in traditional media about artificial intelligence and every element of it, from the companies who are investing in that space and trying to build businesses in it to every other industry in the world who has to start thinking about how to take advantage of the opportunities brought about by AI, but also the risks presented by it. So let's begin with a baseline. You have an experience actually being part of and and building an AI-based company. 
Let's start with your perspective on this. Uh, is there more hype than substance here, or do you really believe artificial intelligence is the next big innovation that will change everything? I really b believe that it will have a big influence on, on the future um, because you, you can see that already. You know, like when I started um, in, the, in the company to work on that field, like I was, it was a startup, I was one of the first engineers, um, and we were like, three or four or five people, not much more. And in a really short time, we got big investments, um, had also an, uh, uh, like a, an office in the US and in London and stuff like this. So there was a lot of growth and a lot of um, investors who were putting money into that. And just to give you that example, we were focused on, it was 2015, and we were focused on the real estate industry um, to, yeah, identify and scan um, real estate contracts, like loan contracts mainly. Because usually like if you have like a huge portfolio about properties in your company, uh, in different kind of countries and different kind of um, languages, the contracts are in different languages and all of that stuff. So it's pretty expensive because you have to always find a lawyer who understands the language, who understands the jurisdiction and um, then collects the most important information out of this contract. And we developed a system which can do that, you know, like from the um, document, which is um, not digitalized in the beginning, we scanned it, did some kind of OCR, like digitalizing it, and then did some kind of classification to understand what kind of document is that? Is it a contract, is it an appendix or whatever? And then to identify really parts of the contract to say, okay, this is the name of the landlord. This is the amount of money which you have to pay monthly and stuff like that. And to be honest, this kind of work, you don't need a legal, um, you don't need to be a lawyer or you need, don't need to have a, a master degree in that field to identify who's the landlord and stuff like this, right? Um, so it is some kind of work which is pretty expensive, especially when you think of the industry. Um, and that was already, like, at that point, um, it was al already very helpful for that industry because it was speeding up things. And I think um, it will have m more and more influence in different areas. Um, you see that in, in all the um, industries right now, I would say. Like, uh, especially the, the ones which are a bit more traditional, I would say, will have some kind of higher pressure on... Um, yeah, uh, adapting and um, finding some kind of solutions which fits to the industry. So it's a disruptive technology. It can fundamentally change business models. It can present opportunities and risks. As you talk to uh, both startups and established businesses who are thinking about how to approach this topic, one of the things that has emerged over the last year is data use, data ownership, and what data you can even train these systems on. Do you believe that we're headed to an, a space where there's going to be a common understanding of how we use, the, let's just say, the data of the internet to apply to any AI model? Or are we going to a place where it's more proprietary, where a large company with a big data set can use AI to simplify it and understand it, but it won't be available to anybody outside of that company? To be honest, like... I think we will have both, you know, like there will be some kind of models which is trained on public models. On, uh, on, there will be models which are trained on public uh, data. For example, ChatGPT is some, one of the solutions which is mainly like public data, which is um, uh, used there. And everyone can use that and is then on the same level. But if you as a company use that, you have already some kind of improvement because you use that technology, but you don't have really a unique differentiator right because everyone can do that right in theory at least and um i think the the on the business side if you really want to um, have some kind of advantages you need to collect your own data and train your own models and um, have this kind of differentiator for your business because everything else is the same you know like everything else the technology behind this with the algorithms and stuff like this um it's often open source you know like you can use that 
So I think we will have both. And I think for businesses, the key is really to collect the data first and then do some analytics about this to figure out, can you identify some additional patterns which help, helps your business to improve and be um, unique? Because like some, some companies have, um, yeah, partnerships and relationships with specific uh, customers and they don't share the data with others, for example. Yeah. And I think that is, that is really the key for the, the business part to really use this kind of, um, close data. What role, if any, do you think that governments will play in this? And I ask this specifically thinking about sensitive industries. So let's say, um, you are a company in one of the critical infrastructures of your country, electrical, gas, water, and you're applying AI technologies, but this is critical. I mean, these are supplies that literally run civil, modern civilizations. I would assume that there'd be some minimum standards uh, that governments would want to apply because these are already heavily regulated industries. But it feels like governments are struggling to understand how to apply regulation to this. I'm curious how you would advise a business that maybe is in the critical infrastructure space or is trying to promote innovation within it to think about how to partner with governments or maybe even how to help advise them so that they can be better regulators of this technology. Yeah. I, I mean, what is clear for me is like, like the, the states, they need to really take care of that topic because right now it's like companies do whatever they want right now. Yeah. With the technology. And I think they need some kind of regulations, but the question is always like, because I had some discussions about that in the past and, some people were saying like we need to regulate it on the research level on the algorithms and, stuff like that. and i think this is not the right way because like you should not do the regulations on the uh, on the t on the technology itself but you should regulate it on how it is used you know like for example in, in when you have a car and there's an engine the engine is usually re regulated so that you can't go faster than some kind of specific amount of uh, miles per hour or something like this. Um, but the technology itself is open. Like in theory, you could do that. But if you want to drive a car, it needs to be in this kind of frame. And I think, um, yeah, the, the states and politics needs to define these kind of rules somehow and work with experts in that field to identify, okay, what are the scenarios? What are the cases which are developed? And how can we um, use that, especially when it goes into the direction of data privacy. Is there anything particularly exciting to you that you've either seen or advised on, or maybe you've just read about uh, in, in your part of the world uh, that you think is, is a particular use case of AI that we should all be excited about and looking forward to? A specific one? Um, yeah, I, I think, especially in the health area, it's very interesting. Because like, you know, like the, for example, to cure cancer, it's a really high, it's a very complex topic because, um, yeah, a lot of different kind of data points which you need to consider. And what they start to do now, at least in Germany, I guess they do it also in other kind of countries to collect, collect these data from different hospitals and stuff like this and even historical data and bring that all together to identify patterns to cure, um, cancer. And I think this is something what was not possible before because like what we did there was like mainly like human brains are limited you know like to identify so many different kind of data points and bring them together and then identify the relationship between these uh, values and um, yeah I think the the AI engines have a have a like they, they open the door to make this more and more possible so I think especially in the health care area that would be a huge um benefit and i'm i'm looking forward to the research in that field especially when it's because it's also for me so interesting it's so connected from one field which is technology and a totally different field um healthcare and um i think to bring these things together and um yeah make it work is really something that will help all of us in one of the 
things we talked about, you know, in our first uh, episode uh, several months ago was the common mistakes that leaders make as they're building startups. Now, I'm curious in your point of view, if the advent of, and we can expand beyond just artificial intelligence, we can also talk about, you know, the, the machine learning element of this. We can talk about the generative AI element of it or, or any other aspect. Do you think it fundamentally changes anything for a startup, somebody who is in that first year? Um, I assume that at the minimum, you have more risks that you have to be now aware of, including that somebody could automate your business away. Uh, but does it change anything or are the fundamentals of those common mistakes still hold true even in the era of AI? Yeah, like I think most of the common mistakes are the same, um, but like you see that it's speeding up things, you know, like in the past, for example, um, you had, for example, as a startup, someone who yeah was deeply focusing on how to create a pitch pitch deck like how to create a presentation and how to do that and you had maybe a business angel who gave you some additional advice right now you can i i saw people um using existing tools to help you to uh, have the perfect pitch because there's a lot of data about which kind of pitch decks were successful and which were failing mainly um so this kind of analytics about it and then creating um, the perfect pitch deck is already Im improving the whole kind of scenario and speeding it up. At the same time, I saw some kind of, I think it was based on ChatGPT, some kind of specialized um, ChatGPTs to say, okay, I need a, um, a kind of advisor who helps me to um, understand what I kind of steps I should do in the beginning of the startup. And instead of having a real person, um, there's the chat who is answering your questions, you know? Um, because most of the time, these are the same questions. Um, and ChatGPT seems to have enough data to be able to do that. So from my perspective, it's speeding up the whole um, area. And I think it's good because like, Maybe startups fail faster than in this kind of way, but if they fa fail fast, that means they were not good enough, which is also uh, some kind of good knowledge to identify, okay, maybe we need to do something else. And um, it was a good idea, but it doesn't work like that. That's fascinating. And I think that's a very good point about helping to accelerate the entire process, especially if an entrepreneur literally gets hung up on developing their presentation and that's their struggle. This can help push past some of those things that really are not core to the business, but are important about how you talk about it. Are there other use cases in the startup space, or maybe have you seen any venture capital firms or others who advise some of their startups about how to potentially utilize some of the tools that AI offers as they get their business off the ground? I saw some stuff in the marketing area, which startup used, um, because like, you know, startups need to have also some kind of visibility right and the social media and stuff stuff like that and to write good articles and have connections to journalists and stuff like this so the whole media industry is also affected by that so um that that can be helpful to work in that field but it, it is very specific you know because sometimes in the beginning of a startup you don't directly need um any kind of pr or something like that but I see startups who are putting some effort into that to have some visibilities and get some con kind of connections to potential corporates and work with them together. And um, yeah, that definitely helps too. As you look to the future, uh, and let's just say the intermediate future, the next four or five years, do you believe that we're going to see big leaps in the adoption of this technology? Or do you feel like there's going to be a period where we slow a bit as government regulators try to get their arms around this and companies, perhaps larger companies, take cautious steps? It feels like we took a big leap from not general public consciousness to an awareness. And then we've had a slow adoption. And I'm curious from your view, if you think that slow adoption will continue, or do you foresee another giant leap coming in the next couple of years? I had the same, uh, I had the same kind of view on that. Like I had also the feeling that it, it goes a bit slower right now because like usually like it's a new tech kind of technology, everybody's jumping on in and then you need to prove it somehow. You know, like you need to prove it and find the right kind of solutions in that field. And I think uh, 
right now we're waiting for the next kind of bigger thing uh, on that field, like the next kind of milestone to reach. And um, yeah, when there are, so it depends really much, you know, but I think in general, if there are some kind of regulations on the, on the political side, and then it might be the case that it slows a bit down. Um, but it's always like back and forth, I would say, you know, like there's a big hype and then it gets maybe a bit slower and then there's a next kind of milestone. So it has another hype around that. And then again, it gets a bit slower. So I think it, it it's um it's a bit like a roller coaster to be honest. There are phases which are um uh, where where it goes up, where it's very strong um and sometimes it's a bit slow. So let's talk for a moment about leading in an era of new technologies. We'll we'll use AI as our example for this, but uh, every leader, whether you're an established company or a growing or an emerging company, is trying to adapt and is trying to educate themselves. Um, I'm curious how you educated yourself. Now, you had the opportunity to actually work in a business that was uh, applying AI. So I feel like you had a bit of an advantage. But if a startup comes to you or even a company that's five, six years old, they're, they're making money now, but they're still growing. And they ask you, how can I educate myself on this topic and how it might apply to my industry? What process or what resources would you advise them to take up? Like I personally do different things, you know, it's not only one kind of resource, which I'm looking at, um, besides like event meets up, meetups and stuff like this, which I joined to meet other people in that field and understand their perspective. Um, there's always ways to read stuff, uh, in the media, um, do some kind of research by yourself. Um, and I think the, the biggest insight you usually get from people who are really working on that field. So if you have the chance somehow to jump on that topic or as a, as a leader in a corporate to say, okay, let's do a kind of um, research project in that field. And maybe one of the employees has a good idea of what they can do and how it could improve their business. Then just to try it out, you know, like it is a kind of investment which you need to take. Um, and I think like by doing it by yourself, that's the, the highest uh like that's the best way how to how to learn it and to un understand how it can uh, help your business. At the same time, I see some kind of um, learning platforms in that field or courses and stuff like that, especially focused on AI, also on the security of AI, for example. Um, and it can be helpful to look at these kind of learning platforms too, especially when you want to not only educate yourself, but also your whole team, for example. So one of the risks, obviously, of this technology that maybe starts to get into the science fiction rather than the reality is, do these systems start learning so quickly that they achieve some sort of general intelligence, systems that can begin to think for themselves? Now, those are probably years away, but do you believe that is a risk worthy of considering? Uh, and let's just take it from the perspective of a business leader that there can be a powerful enough tool that can begin to generate ideas of its own that can then be copyrighted or can become competitors to your business. Do you think that's a credible threat or do you feel like that's on the fringes of science fiction and not something, not a risk that you'd be taking seriously? I think at some point it might go into that direction if you, if we don't take the right kind of regulations on it. You know, like, for example, if you look again at ChatGPT right now, it is... A, a, a tool where you can ask a question, you get uh, get an answer, right? So it's not really ex it's not really executing. But at some point, I'm pretty sure somebody um, will create a layer where it can execute on a computer. For example, I can ask ChatGPT, "How can I create a website or something like this?" Okay, I'm not an engineer, and I want to know how to do it, and it can give me. Example is even though write the code for me to um, identify how that works, but it's not executing it. So I as a person has to really do it. And I'm sure at some point somebody will write a layer where this kind of system has direct access to an operational system, like to an own computer, and then say, okay, I create this kind of uh, website right now. Um, and I think this this is a scenario which at some point might be the case that somebody will implement that because it's for me it's like 
the whole AI field is mainly about automation on a different level. You know, you try to automate and improve things on a different level. Um, and the tricky part is to use it in a way so that it's secure for everyone around us. Um, I'm also curious how, uh, from the context that you have, uh, how the private market views this trend uh, from the venture capitals to, uh, you know, those who are in various forms of private equity. Um, what are they investing in? What are you hearing about? Uh, or or do they feel like this is a fad and, and they're not specifically making investments in or taking too much time to think about or analyze this space? To be honest, I don't see huge investments in that field. Like it's not like crazy that everybody's focused on that because I think right now people are more focused on, okay, we have this AI technology, but how can we do right like, real use cases right now so that improve, we can improve the business? I have the feeling this general idea is like really something in the future and um, the technology is not ready for that, you know, because like I'm, I'm sure like scientists on universities and stuff like this are working um, extremely on, on this topic. But in the current market, especially in Europe and Germany, they are more or less focused on, okay, how can we use that and improve our own business with that? So it's not so much on this general AI topic. Do you feel like there is a practical application today that should be widely used? Uh, or do you feel like we're still in the early days of this and a handful of these tools might be useful to individuals, but not the public as a whole? That's a good question. Um, no, I think it's very individualized, to be honest, because everyone has different kind of needs maybe like i don't i can't right now think of something specific which would be generalized for everyone um i'm pretty sure there are some but right now like i'm i, I would not be focused on one something specific there. and how about the implication on jobs i mean one of the things that has been a risk or identified in this is that if ai is uh, adopted at scale it may likely mean fewer jobs for humans as more of those jobs that people used to do get automated away. Do you think there's legitimate concern there or do you think that's a bit of an overhyped issue? No, that's already the case, to be honest. You know, like I, I know media companies and they put a lot of effort uh, to um, identify how they can use that. They have own uh, IT and uh, AI departments who are very focused on how to do that because like if you're an online media company like and you're generating articles mainly um you can do that much faster with um some kind of generative text um solutions and um they are putting a lot of effort into that field because in the future um it will be it will be different now is there anything as you're building a team and you're now evaluating the talent of the people that you're bringing in. Let's use the startup example. I would say a couple of years ago, technical capability was always important, uh, but nobody would have asked about AI in an interview, I don't think. Um, now I feel like that is a, a legitimate topic to determine your skill level in that field. So I'm curious uh, from your perspective, um, if you're interviewing leaders for your company, are you asking them about their comfort with this technology or is it a nice to have? Um, no, I think I, I'm always asking if they use it and how they use it. Um, it depends very much on what kind of role you're um, hiring for. But uh, in the software engineering area, for example, there are there's something which is called, for example, GitHub Copilot, there are other kind of solutions in that field from AWS and other companies, um, which helps to generate some kind of code for you to improve on that. And I, I'm I'm always asking this question because I'm I, I try to understand, okay, is this person someone who has this kind of automation mindset? Because like your work is much takes much more, longer time if you don't do use that. Um, and at the same time, you know when you when you um, when you use these kind of tools, but you don't understand still the code and you just do copy and paste, that's still an issue, you know? Um, because you, you, 
when you do the software development, it's usually specific things. If you want to add some kind of button or something like this, that's easy. Um, it's easy to understand how that works and stuff like this. But you have some kind of higher complexity on, I don't know, multi-threading or something like that. Then you can maybe generate a kind of template from these tools, but you really deeply need to understand how it works to adapt it to your use case. You know, it's not on that level right now that you can um, automate that fully. So therefore, I always ask engineers, software engineers, how they use it. And I, on top of that, I ask them still these kind of technical questions to understand, okay, is that a person who um, just mainly copy paste everything? Or is that something who understands how that works and how the technology is behind that? Now, one of the things about AI is it's built on data. And there seems to be a growing debate around the world about the ownership of that data. Um, anything that you generate historically, if it's creative content, you can get a copyright for it and it's an intellectual property. Um, AI is really built around access to as much data as it can study and learn off of. And I think there's a growing debate about this. Do you have a point of view about what data should be open for AI systems to learn about? And, and what maybe should be proprietary, or even if there should be a compensation model, if your data is being used to train a model, should you be getting some sort of monetary value off of that? Um, it would be nice if, it, if it's possible to do it like that, you know, like to have someone, to have them, so, or to claim, okay, this is kind of my content. Um, but right now I don't have the, I, I didn't see any kind of good ideas of how to solve that issue. So everything what is public right now, People will use it. The only thing what I saw, which was interesting to me, is that you can identify the source. Okay, there are some AI systems, and you can ask them a question, for example, and they give you an answer, but you can identify, okay, where does the source come from? Especially when it goes into the direction of fake news and stuff like that. It is important to understand, okay, where does this information come from? Who said this? Is that something? what uh, comes from a professor from, I don't know, a research paper or whatever, or is that something what just the AI engine generates and it's more or less a black box and you don't know where the content come from, comes from. So this kind of, where's the source? Where, where, where does that come from? Is I think an important part. And if you have that, then you can talk about, okay, um, maybe, someone who wrote has this kind of first idea or wrote this down and has this insight should um, have a benefit from it. And then uh, when you're thinking about leaders of the future, um, do you feel like this is a core competency that you would expect to see? And I don't mean that somebody who necessarily knows how to build an AI system from the ground up, but do you believe that this becomes as fundamental as your core business school classes or whether or not you went to formal school, maybe you got trained on it, your ability to converse in the language of AI, do you think this is becoming foundational for any future leader or entrepreneur? I think it will play a big role. Um, it, it will be important not deeply to understand how this technology works, you know, all the algorithms and stuff like this, but on how you can use it and what it is capable of. Um, I think it's a bit similar to when computers came into the industry, you know? Um, at some point, everyone had an IT department. Maybe we have in the future, every company has an AI department who understands and identifies, okay, how can we use that? But I think for leaders, the important part is really to, um, yeah, collect the data first, like to make sure that data is available so that you can use it at all. Do some kind of data science on it, have like people in the team who do, who's doing that, doing the research and the AI work. And then, to see, okay, can we identify patterns in our data to use that somehow for our business? Um, so to enable this as a leader is important. And this second thing, I think I th said this before, it's the ed educational part. To have this kind of, okay, this constant learning that's like lifelong learning, never stop because it goes on, it goes on. Uh, also, you have a unique perspective, I think, because of all the folks that you get to interact with at all age levels. I'm curious if you're seeing any difference in the comfort level of older people who've been in business for 25 or 30 years and their ability to adopt this versus younger entrepreneurs. Maybe they're only a couple of years removed 
from school, uh, and maybe this is more second nature to them. Is, is there an age uh, difference as to how people are learning it and applying it? In general, yes. But I think that is that is a general issue with learning new stuff, you know, because like when you get older, you stick to the stuff which you know, and um, when you're like a young person out of the university, um, you're a bit more open-minded to learn new stuff because you are curious. But to be honest, I know also a lot of other people who are very interested in all these technologies. Um, I just think it's easier when you're younger to learn that. And I think this is the reason why people are more open to that when they're a bit younger. Are you seeing any cultural differences? I, I can speak from the United States and the American point of view that on the one hand, there's that spirit of let's try everything and see how it goes. But there's also been a little bit of pushback, uh, especially around the idea of data privacy. And that might be a, I think it's a global issue, but I think uniquely in the United States, the idea that your your data can be used without your permission has rubbed people the wrong way here. I'm curious, as you're looking at businesses around the world, if some countries and cultures are more accepting than others. I think so. Um, I mean, especially in Germany, maybe you know that the regulations about data privacy is pretty high. So they're often a bit like, okay, I don't even want to have the data in the cloud, you know? It should not be on AWS cloud. It should be on my own server in Germany and stuff like this. So I, it was in the past pretty strong, I would say. And I had the feeling it's even stronger, this opinion, since the AI kicked in. Because like now it's very much based on your data. And um, yeah, on the one side, I can understand it. But it it's, it's, it's slows down the the research and the development in that field. So it has pros and cons. Um, yeah, I, I think there are other kind of states, for example, which are a bit more open to that topic. Um, and I think the tricky part is to hold this somehow in balance, you know, to, to find a kind of way to have enough security on the data privacy and at the same time to not stop the development based on that. You know, there are te techniques to, to do that. Uh, it just slows the process a bit down. For example, if you have to anonymize all the data before you can use it and stuff like that. But it, it will be something what uh, is important to have not any kind of, um, yeah, fraud, for example. So in the last few minutes that we have together, I wanted to ask a more broad question about the business uh, climate that you're seeing, both among your clients and, and those you advise. Um, it certainly feels like I grew up in an era of globalization and technology was a, a democratized form of business where truly you had to work across countries, across time zones and around the world to achieve anything of great success. And most of the large technology companies around the world are global in nature. It certainly feels from a layperson's perspective that while globalization is still there, there's been a, a pushback. And now there's more of a push to bring back onshore some of the resources that used to be sent abroad, that there's almost a, a political imperative to stay within your country's borders than to expand beyond it. Now, that's a general view. I'm curious from somebody who's actually working in the business world and, and consulting and advising on global companies, is that something that you're observing at the business level or are businesses still reaching out across international borders, finding solutions and working together? I, I mean, I see that on the political side. On, in the business, in my field, I don't see it so strongly, to be honest. Like in the research field, not at all. And most of the businesses which I'm um, working with, they're international based. So there are some kind of companies who have anyways some um, some kind of offices in other countries and they interact on a regular basis with that. But I, I, I have similar feelings about the situation, but I think it's more related to the political fields um, of the states, for example, East and West and stuff like that. Um, and I, 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 I hope that it uh, will not go stronger into that direction because I think it's pretty important that we are all open-minded to develop that further together. Because if you, if you have only one uh, party who is just developing in one direction, then it, um, yeah, it, it, there's this kind of com uh, competi competition, um, which might be 
helpful sometimes, but it can also go into a wrong direction from my perspective. So I hope more for the for the area of okay, let's collaborate. And then lastly, in terms of technology that uh, any given company develops or creates, there's been a debate. I think in the public eye around what responsibility does a company have for how their technology is ultimately used, right? So you can come up with the greatest, whether it's artificial intelligence or a traditional form of technology, um, even our social media platforms at one point was someone's great idea, but you couldn't possibly have known how it would be used and in some cases used in a very negative way. What, what is your view about any company that develops a new proprietary technology that they own the intellectual property to? What is their responsibility for determining how and where that technology is used and deployed, assuming that they make money off of its application? If a government chooses to use your technology to spy on its people, for example, you know what responsibility does the owner or the founder have to not allow that technology to be used in that way? Or is it out of your hands once you've released it out to the world? Um, I'm... It's, I think it's not, you can't cover it fully, you know, like you can't make it, it's like a knife. You can develop a knife, but you don't know how the people will use it. Maybe somebody is using it to cut a bread or make a sandwich or something like this, but somebody else can use it also to threaten someone. So it's not really fully in your control. You can just take care of it and make sure, okay, um, uh, like first of all, to communicate that this is not made for specific cases and then um and there i think the uh, political and legal aspect comes in to have some regulations about about that from the from the government you know similar like how um i don't know like uh, maybe the car example that you have a license for example to drive a week uh, uh, to drive a car something like that and maybe there's something like that where you need to have a license to use specific kind of tools. Um, yeah, because based on that, you can track it, right? You can track who is doing that, who is using that. If it's really a, a, a kind of technology and solution, which is can be very dangerous for the society. And then uh, lastly, when we think about countries that you would be willing to work with, do business with, um, anytime you're working with a country, you have to comply with the rules and regulations of that of that jurisdiction. But there are some very large countries in the world that have very restrictive uh, policies. And yet, if you don't work with them, your technology can suffer from it. I'm curious how you advise businesses and how you yourself think about who you're willing to do business with and, and who you're not, whether that's a, a, you know, let's, without calling out anybody in particular, let's just say a government that has a questionable human rights record versus, you know, a government that has a democracy on its face and a free and open market, but has an administration that's controversial. How do you think about working with those comp uh, those countries or working within those countries and then messaging that back to your shareholders and your employees when there may be disagreements about it? It's, it's, it's a hard, um, like it's a hard decision, but I think it depends very much on the values which you have as a company. And um, based on that, you can decide if you should go into that direction or not. But from my perspective, like, I need to align with your own kind of rules. Like if, if you wouldn't do that in your own home, why should you do it somewhere else? You know, like I think you, it is important to stick to that. Um, because it, it, it can fire back at some point, you know, to take this decision. I know, for example, companies in Germany who had outsourced a lot of stuff in other kind of countries and now they have huge issues, uh, about about doing that. If people would like to learn more about you and your consultancy and uh, your opinions and views, where would be the best place for people to find out more about you and, and follow you, your opinions? I think the easiest thing is over my website, like projector.com, and I'm available on LinkedIn, so they can send me a message. I'm usually answering pretty quickly. And if there's some kind of interesting topic where, we, where I can help, I'm always happy to jump on the call and um, connect to the people to see what we can do. Excellent. 
Once again, thank you very much for joining the program, and we look forward to having you back again. Thank you, Brian. It was so nice, nice to speak to you. Thanks. So much to consider in this space. Uh, we, we've we talked about the topic of artificial intelligence, its applications and its implications many times in this program for a very important reason. Our objective here beyond just exploring the big trends that go beyond the daily headlines is to try to give you an insider's view of what's to come because the whole purpose of curiosity is to learn and the objective of learning about what's happening now is so that you can get ahead of the curve and apply the potential lessons being learned today and seek the opportunities for the future to keep you one step ahead. And that's the competitive advantage we hope that the listeners of this program get that others do not. And I really think that folks like Payman who are in a consulting seat and whose job it is to help keep their clients ahead of the curve and to consider the applications of tools that could fundamentally disrupt their industry. And can you think of an industry that will get more disrupted than the tech industry, both in good and potentially negative ways? So I'm very grateful that he has been a returning guest. I hope to bring payment back again in the future. And every time we have big leaps forward uh, in both business, technology, and now in this case, uh, AI and its related applications, uh, who better to talk to than those who are in the trenches uh, with clients dealing with these issues every day? So we have a lot of great guests coming up this season, too. Uh, and I look forward to previewing some of those on upcoming episodes. Um, and we are going to bring back some of our favorite guests. Uh, for example, in a couple of weeks, uh, Bradley Sherman is going to be back with us. Uh, you might remember from last year, we talked in depth about demographic changes and shifts around the world, especially in the U.S., some of the implications that has for governments, businesses, nonprofits, schools, communities. Uh, well, it's a year later. Some things have changed. Some things have updated. And we have a big election coming up in the United States where demographics will be front and center, uh, potentially, as to who turns out and who shows up and potentially who wins uh, that election for president in the U.S., but also at other layers down the ballot. So, I know many of you were fans of Bradley's last year, another popular podcast download, as well as one of our most watched clips on YouTube, listen to clips on YouTube. So Bradley's coming back in a couple of weeks, but next week we have a treat for you and a new guest to the program. Carlo Ruza is joining us. Carlo is a senior professor of political sociology at the University of Trento School of International Studies in Trento, Italy. And we have a long, wide-ranging conversation around populism. Now, we're going to focus most of that conversation on Europe, where his specialties are, but we will do our best to go around the world and talk about this movement. We're going to help define it, because I think that term has been thrown around a lot without clear definition. We're going to talk about some of the trends, and his research really focuses on the political rule of law and how important that is in constraining some of the more extreme elements of populist movements, but how populist movements over time can start to wear down uh, the rule of law and the risks that that may have for democratic order throughout the free world and the implications that it can have on daily life, on uh, our families, our communities, and our businesses. So we've explored different areas of uh, political expression and political movements and parties, but I don't think we've really been able to focus on a topic like this before. So very much looking forward to bringing Carlo onto the program. Hope you'll join us next week. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the program. You can find us on any of your favorite podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, the Odyssey app, uh, and any, any other uh, podcast application that you choose to get your podcasts from. You can also find us on YouTube. Just search Brian J. Matos Podcast on YouTube and visit my website, brianjmatos.com, for all the latest episodes, blog posts, uh, and for links to get to any one of those podcast platforms. As always, thank you all for joining the program. Look forward to speaking with you again next time. And in the meantime, I hope... You will all stay curious.